Episode 57. Sefidin a moose at bit block boom. Interested in Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a very vague concept to a lot of people. Need to know more about cryptocurrency? We're going to talk about the basics. You know, this is something that people just have no idea about what crypto is. How about buying, selling, and mining? Tony, I think that's one of the things that's going to make us a little different from some other shows. We're getting our hands dirty. Then listen to Gary Leland and Tony Sakala, better known as the Crypto Cousins, on the Crypto Cousins Podcast. This week's price. This week's price of Bitcoin, $7,140. That's down. $594.41 or 7.7% over the last seven days. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Welcome to the Crypto Cousins. And this is Tony Sakala. Oh, I forgot to say I'm Gary Leela. Because <laughs> <laughs> you knew you were Gary. I know it already. Hey, you know, even though Bitcoin is down... You know, so much, you know, you know how depressed I get when I see Bitcoin's down for the day. When I say this every morning, every Thursday, I get depressed when it's down. I have got to say it is up for the month, $555. That, yes. always, that makes me feel There's better. how you look at it. Yeah, exactly. so I'm, I started realizing that after the last show. I need to, like, remember and look at the month when I get depressed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's up, what, 2x since we started the show. Well, that was almost a year ago, so... Since in the last year, in the last year, three thousand six hundred forty-eight dollars, or one hundred and six point seven percent. So you're correct. Very wise, Tony. I try to be wise at least once a day. Hey, I want to also, Tony. I don't know if you've been seeing the behind the scenes, but I've been working hard with Ray Redacted on the Crypto Cousins first year anniversary party which we're still yes yes it's very much behind the scenes but i have been getting i got 49 message alerts from my text uh text machine yesterday morning before i even put on my pajamas so i muted the conversation raise a text machine he's a text machine you guys are going back and forth i was like wait a second i have not even had my caffeine yet so i let you guys finish the conversation we're gonna have a great party somewhere in dallas I think I found the location. I hadn't even told Ray, but I'm going to get into that later. But it's like September 29th is our one-year anniversary of the show. I stole this idea from Joel and Travis at Bad Crypto, so I want to, I, I want to be up front about that. I'm a, I'm a stealer. Open, open source. Open source. <laughs> I'm, a st- I'm a thief. I'll, you give me a good idea, I'm going to run with it. And that was a good idea. So it was a good idea because it gave us a reason to have a party. And, Tony, I know you like to have a party. I love a party. So – We'll see how this goes. I don't know if we'll have uh, 10 people show up or if we'll have 50, but the uh, details will be coming soon. So today's a long show, so that's all I'll have to say about that. I do notice you have a news article in here, Tony. Uh, let's go over that real quick. What's this about? So uh, we've got simultaneous takedown from Google, Facebook, and Apple took down a famous blogger uh I'm not going to mention his name because if you mention his name, your YouTube channel might get uh, flagged. So anyway, uh, they took down a big guy and uh, it's big in the news and it it opens up a big conversation about freedom of speech, corporate responsibility. So many issues are being discussed. I think it's uh, I think it's fascinating to see what's happening and where people fall on the debate about whether you can take down someone uh, who has uh, what some people deem as hate speech. And we had, Tony and I had a long debate about this before the show even started. Yes, we, 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 didn't, <laughs> turn on the, we didn't turn on the, the recording, and uh, we had our most heated discussion about it, and it, was, it is quite interesting. But today's not the day to talk about it, because we have a really great show for you. Well, I, th- I think we need to tell, maybe give people more information than that, though, now that we've brought up the subject. So you're saying on this person who was taken off the air, who we're not naming because, as you said, (laughs) we may get taken off the air. Uh But uh, you're saying that I want to go into your theory there. Is that okay? We go into your theory? Oh, yeah. If you you feel like we have the time, I know you didn't. Yeah, no, I I tried to, but now we've opened up the can of worms. Let's get into it real quick. You think the Rothschilds contacted Apple and uh, Google and Facebook and Facebook and said, take this person off the air. And that it was done. It's a done deal. So you're saying this censorship, which we wasn't government censorship for sure, 
since the Republicans are in power, um, I, I would go along with that. But you think this censorship was caused by a private entity that has control over the media? I'm saying when three actors act in concert together, you have to look for an outside influence. And I believe that uh, how information is spread, how uh, we communicate in, on this planet is tightly controlled. And you can see very clearly that when someone does, a real person steps out of line and takes the state secrets and tells them to, to everyone, that it's like someone like Julian, that person is punished severely. Uh, Snowden's on the run. Um, and, um, the other person, um, uh, Lieutenant Manning, uh, you know, was behind bars for many, many years. And so these people, uh, who speak out and give it the state's secrets are severely punished and made an example of. And of course, similarly, our good friend Ross Ulbricht, uh, was made an example of. So you have people, when you do something like that, you're swiftly punished. Now, whether or not the current actor is, uh, you know, and I watched the show and he seems like an actor, is really one of those people. But the bottom line is now there's a chilling effect. And we're, you know, concerns us even say his name because then our YouTube channel will get taken down. It's just a question of what you can say on these private platforms. So where is the opportunity to speak without censorship and to spread ideas? And when you can stop the spread of ideas, then you have control over society. Well, now, see, now you're opening up another can of worms here, you know, and this show is going to be long, so we should do a show where we have our conspiracy theories. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know, as far as I can tell, you know, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I kind of try to keep up with the news that Manning actually stole private information from the government. Isn't that why he went to prison? Not for, for actually stealing top secret information? Now, the other information, like to Julian Song, was given to him, mm -hmm. and he released it. I think that's mm -hmm. a different case than actually stealing and releasing top secret information. Am I wrong there? Or, or well, you we don't can definitely debate the the issue of Chelsea Manning treatment and uh, and punishment was you know swift and harsh. And I'm pointing out that when you do that, whether it's right or wrong, look, laws are in place; they stand alongside of ethics. Uh, is it was legal to own slaves for, in this country for many, many years. It was legal to ban blacks from eating at a certain restaurant. Legal and right are two different things. So we're not debating whether Lieutenant Manning did anything illegal or legal. But the point is that when certain actors step out of the line, they're swiftly punished. And now we have this uh, chilling effect on the media of what you can say. Look, we're bloggers. We're podcasters. You know, what we say if it can be hushed, then we have a concern here. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Like I said, we're in a hurry today, so I tried to give this some time. This show's going to be long. So, um, But I would like people, if you have a comment or thought on that subject, post it on Twitter and uh, post hashtag Crypto Cousins mm -hmm. so we can see your thoughts. Um, yeah, we like to chat on Twitter. Yeah, because some people will uh, have a thought, and if you do. But let's get on to today's subject. This uh, has to do with BitBlock Boom that we had in July. And we're going to bring you a, something from Safe Adin Amus uh, from the show there. But um, we're going to do BitBlock Boom again in 2019. What was the date that we think we picked, Tony? We have targeted June 22nd. That's a weekend of the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. It'll be a big party weekend uh, with uh, events on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We won't go into the details, but this is definitely going to be the Bitcoin maximalist event of next year here in the U.S. In England, and I mean in Europe, they have uh, several events. We've got the Giacomo Zucco doing uh, events there and uh, very big in the Bitcoin maximalist framework. But here, you know, we haven't had too many. And so we feel like our conference is unique and we feel like we're doing the work to keep Bitcoin at the top of the heap. Bitcoin is uh, the one that started it all. And you are correct. And so we're, um, we're a, a Bitcoin conference. We're not a 
scam coin conference. <laughs> You're looking for the S word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to say that. <laughs> I try to keep the show clean so we can actually have a clean rating on Google. Not that I mind. I don't have any problem cussing. I just try to. Yeah, I just but... try to keep it clean for Google. I mean, for uh, Apple. But yeah, so that's it. Matter of fact, before we get going, and and the page will be going up soon with the new information, which is a bit block boom, and you can go there and see how this year's conference was. And uh, before we go on, though, I want to play this comment Ray Redacted sent us. Ray's getting a lot of press time today. He really is. He did last show, too, I think. He ought to be, like, becoming our great buddy here, you would think. But let's play this comment Ray Redacted sent in yesterday. Hey, guys, this is Ray. I just wanted to tell you again uh, what a great job you did on BitBlock Boom, uh, especially keeping all of the topics – uh, unique and different. So it wasn't just specifically about one particular area of cryptocurrency or cryptography. There's a wide variety of different topics that were, that were explored and discussed. Very much looking forward to your future events, and I'll see you on Twitter. Well, those were some kind words from Ray. They certainly were, yes. Yeah, I like Ray. I like Ray. He's a nice guy. He bought me a drink. Anyone who buys me a drink, you know, <laughs> I think he even bought me some food. <laughs> so. wow. Doesn't take much to become my good yeah, friend. Buy me yeah. a drink. Buy me some nachos. You know, we're buddies. <laughs> <laughs> well, today we have, though, a special treat. Uh, what we're doing is we're giving you the audio from Safety and the Moose's presentation. And this is like a special deal, so don't this be This is our keynote. Yeah, this is our keynote address at BitBlock Boom in 2018. So, uh, yeah, Gary decided, and I thought it was a good idea, to, uh, to get this out while it's hot off the press. And I want everybody, this isn't going to be a regular deal. This is just a special thing we're doing for you guys, the listeners that couldn't make it there. So I kind of hope you enjoy it. Tony, you want to give us a little uh, bio on SAFE? Dr. Safe Dean Amos is the assistant professor of economics at the Lebanese American University and a foreign member of the Center on Capitalism and Society at Columbia University. He is the author of The Bitcoin Standard, the first serious academic treatise on Bitcoin. And he's been researching Bitcoin and blockchain technology as an academic and consultant for seven years. So basically, this book has broken ground on the uh, – it's hit the charts. It's out published by Wiley, and uh, everyone recognizes it. it's a really great look at sound money and what Bitcoin means for uh, money on this planet. It's not about – Bitcoin price. It's not about Bitcoin details, technical details. It's about Bitcoin's impact on the world. Very good. I enjoyed his book. Uh, matter of fact, he gave me a copy of his book and he put in there, thanks for having me at BitBlock Boom. It was really personalized, pretty nice. Yeah, yeah. We both got a copy. And then he said uh, at our Bitcoin brunch on Sunday, maybe you already said this, but he said that ours, he felt like, was the first Bitcoin maximalist convention he had been to in North America. Yes, it was. So I thought that was kind of cool. Well, like so, this show's going to be long today because this was a long presentation. So why don't we just go straight to this, Tony? Jump like right into the presentation. Absolutely. Um, to these three main issues that I'm going to get into in more detail. So first of all, what makes Bitcoin unique, in my opinion, is that if you think about it, pretty much anything can be used as money. You know, the definition of money is that it is a medium of exchange. In other words, anytime you buy something, not for its own sake, but in order to exchange it for something else, that thing is a medium of exchange. So there's no law anywhere. Well, there is now because we're in the, still living in the 20th century. But, you know, for all of human history, there was no law that says what you can use as a medium of exchange. You can choose anything to exchange with anybody. But the question is, what ends up being good for it? You know, so you can also use all sorts of things for any purposes. But generally, because of the properties of something, some things do certain jobs better than others. So anything can be used as money. Anything can be used as a store of value and exchange. But there's a thing, that there's a trap there, which I call the easy money trap, which is that if you end up using something as a medium of exchange and a store of value that can be easily produced, it will be easily produced. Because once you make more, once you demand something as a store of value, you have to understand that that is a demand above and beyond its industrial demand. It's above and beyond demand for it as a market good. 
So if everybody tomorrow in the US, let's say, decides that they want to use copper as money, that's just going to mean everybody buying up a lot more copper than they usually do. You know, how much copper do you buy per day? Maybe a few grams per day per person, you know, if you count all the copper that goes into all the electronics that you buy. But then if you decided that you were going to be using copper as money, you know, you're going to be needing to buy kilograms and kilograms of copper and using them as a store of value and then exchanging them with others. So naturally, that's going to lead to an increase in the demand for copper, which is going to lead to a rise in the price of copper. But, of course, copper miners are going to enjoy this. They're going to see that the price of copper has gone up. That's an opportunity for them to make money. So what are they going to do? They're going to start producing more copper, and they're going to start increasing the supply of copper on the market until the price of copper comes back down. And that's why copper is a lousy money. It's very easy for them to produce. And so you are raising the price of it as it goes up, and then they are dropping the price of it as they increase the supply. And therefore, the end result is that the value that you stored in the copper has been taken away. And you can see this also with government money in a place like Venezuela. Because people have to put their value in um, bolivars, because bolivars are uh, money that the government de uh, decides people must use, the value of the bolivar goes up, and then the government prints more of it, and then the value comes down. So this anything that, anything that is easy to make as money ends up being pretty lousy money. Only things that are hard to make can succeed as money in the long term. Because people in Venezuela, you know, they try and get rid of their bolivars as fast as they can. People who have copper as money, well, nobody does these days, but people who did, you know, they, they have to get rid of it eventually. And the only kind of thing that ends up getting used as money are things that are hard to make. And so if you look at the human history and you try and see what are the things that we have as money? What are the things that we've used as money? We find that at any particular point in time, anything that was used as money was hard to produce. So cattle were used as money because they're very hard to produce and they're very precious. Rare seashells in societies where the seashells, um, you know, where seashells, where some kinds of seashells were rare, it was always the rarest of seashells that were used as money. Glass beads in areas that didn't produce glass. So in the west of Africa, there was um, glass beads that were imported from abroad were used as money because they were very rare and it was hard for people there to make glass. Metals, when we first started metallurgy, they started getting used as money, initially by weight, but then over time, as we started producing more and more of them, only the precious metals were used as money. And then they started getting minted into coins and uniform weights and so on. And even with government money, if you look around the world today, and I discuss this in my book, you'll see that the kinds of currencies that are popular all over the world, the ones that are used predominantly as money, like the dollar, the euro, or the uh, yen, um, the British pound, the Swiss franc, these are the currencies that are used internationally, as opposed to the uh, national currencies that... Uh, and these ones are characterized by the fact that their supply is relatively harder to make. So the supply of dollars and euros grows on average by about 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 percent per year, something like that. Whereas if you looked at you know, the currencies of places like Venezuela or Zimbabwe, the supply grows at a much, much, much faster rate. So within government money as well, we see that the hard monies are the ones that get used and the easy monies get dumped. And so all over the world, you know, third world countries all over the world, they use dollars for their reserve currencies. They don't use each other's reserve currencies. And people in third world countries try and get their hands on dollars whenever they can, and they try and use them whenever they can, because relative to their local currencies, the dollar is very hard. It increases at a much lower rate. So this is why Bitcoin is important, in my opinion. Bitcoin is the hardest money we've ever invented. We've never had a money that is harder than this. And this is my favorite chart in the world, and it is the monetary supply of Bitcoin. I can see Pierre smiling. It was a blog post by Pierre many, many years ago that showed me this chart for the first time. And then I basically expanded that blog post into a book and made a living out of it. So thanks, Pierre. Uh, so essentially, the black line shows us the number of Bitcoins that exist in the world. And as you see, it increases quite quickly, and then the rate of increase declines. And then it will steady at around 21 million. It, it'll never exceed 21 million. And so the growth rate of the money supply for Bitcoin, as you can see, is the, great li is the gray line. Starts off very high because we start from zero and we're increasing it uh, very quickly. 
But then as the stock of coins that exists increases and the new coins decline in the number of new coins declines, the growth, the supply growth rate begins to decline more and more and more. And as we see, the supply growth rate has dropped. So right now, Bitcoin's supply grows at around 4% per year, which is comparable to a good, uh, relatively good government kind of money. So this is around how much the dollar grows per year, more or less. But over the next few years, it's just going to keep declining more and more and more, and it's going to become a lower uh, percentage growth rate until effectively the supply growth rate drops to zero. So this makes Bitcoin, in my opinion, I mean, in, in right now it's at about 4%, and in a few years, in about 2024 or 25, it's going to drop below 1.5%. And that's, I think, significant because that's the rate at which gold's supply grows. The reason that gold ended up being money, and I discussed this extensively in the book, but I didn't really, uh, um, I, I don't talk about it much in this presentation. If you look at the history of gold, and the reason that gold ends up being money, ended up being money everywhere in the world at the turn of the twentieth, at the turn of the, at the end of the nineteenth century, is that gold supply increases at a very slow rate. Gold supply increases at around one to two percent per year every year, and this never changes. Because gold is very hard to find, gold is very f expensive to mine, and so even as the price of gold rises, it's very hard for us to find large quantities of gold. So if you look at the data over the last 80, 90 years or so for the gold production all over the world, you'll see that we've never had a year in which gold supply increased by more than 2%, and the average is almost always around 1.5%. So Bitcoin is going to go beneath that in a few years. It's still above that. It's still more inflationary than Bitcoin now, but it's going to go below that in a few years. So this is why I think Bitcoin is unique. That's really the monetary uniqueness of Bitcoin. When anything gets, gets chosen as a store of value, its production will increase. The people who are able to produce it will make more of it. That applies to copper, applies to government money, applies to anything. As soon as people start storing their value in it, the price goes up and then the incentive for the producers to produce more of it is too high. And that's really, you know, all of political economy is just that. It's really what it comes down to. Governments, when they, if they manage to hold their currency uh, and if they manage to, you know, not abuse it, not inflate it, the demand for it goes up, the value for it goes up, and that just gives them a stronger incentive to inflate it and abuse it. And, you know, history has shown us that governments have been pretty lousy at resisting that temptation. And um, we see that with all kinds of uh, industrial metals or any kind of money. As long as, it's, as long as it gets chosen as a store of value, it's like a bounty for everybody to figure out a way to make more of this thing, to increase the supply of it. Because then, if you can manage to make more of it, you are able to take the purchasing power that's in it without having to work, right? If you figure out a way to print dollars, then you can increase the supply of dollars and you're devaluing all of the savings that everybody is putting into dollars and becoming rich without having to work hard. And you know, that's the dream, right? Everybody wants to get rich without working hard. That's human nature. So Bitcoin is there to fix that. Bitcoin is unique because if it gets chosen as a store of value, its value goes up but absolutely nobody can produce more of it. There's no way that the demand for, uh, will, uh, for Bitcoin will lead to an increase in the supply. In other words, the supply is completely irresponsive to demand, and it's completely irresponsive to changes in price. That's what really is unique about Bitcoin, in my opinion. So if tomorrow 5 billion people are using Bitcoin, the, price of, the, the new amount of Bitcoin produced tomorrow is still going to be around 1,800 Bitcoins. If five people only are using Bitcoin, not five billion, only five, we're still going to have 1,800 Bitcoins produced. It's quite astonishing when you think about it, and it doesn't apply to anything else, you know? If tomorrow everybody uses copper as money, the production of copper is going to go up. If tomorrow everybody decides to drop copper as money, the production of copper will go down. Every good, whether it's a monetary good or a metal, or, or even a government currency, the supply is, to an extent, responsive to the price and to the demand, except for Bitcoin. Instead, what Bitcoin does, and you know, I'm not going to get too technical in this, but more detailed explanations are in my book. What happens is, 
the Bitcoin supply, the new supply that's going to be produced is fixed. We're only going to have $1,800 1, new Bitcoins produced. But if the price has gone up and people are trying to produce and uh, trying to mine more Bitcoin because the price of Bitcoin is going up, how does Bitcoin deal with that? Through the difficulty adjustment. And that, in my opinion, is the magic sauce that makes Bitcoin work. It's really the key secret ingredient that Satoshi Nakamoto was able to add to this technology to allow it to function, which is that the difficulty of mining will adjust to the number of people that are mining it, to the amount of processing power that is going towards mining Bitcoin, rather than having the quantity of Bitcoins adjust. It's an incredibly smart idea that seems like every incredibly smart idea, it seems obvious in hindsight, but it isn't. It obviously wasn't very obvious. But if you look at you know, the technologies that are used in Bitcoin, the majority of them, or maybe even all of them, were present in previous examples and previous attempts at making hard money, at, at making digital money. What Bitcoin brought that is unique is this thing, the difficulty adjustment. And that's what made it workable because that means that there's no risk of the supply being inflated because more people are using it. There's no risk of the supply being increased as more people use it. And so that makes the thing, it makes Bitcoin useful as a store of value. So the difficulty of the mining goes up, which means that you now need a much higher processing power in order to start mining the same amount of Bitcoin. And so as a result, as the price of Bitcoin increases, we don't get a supply response. We don't get an increase in the supply. Instead, what we get is an increase in the difficulty of increasing the supply. In other words, you now need more electricity and more processing power to produce the same 1,800 Bitcoins that you produce every day. Okay? In other words, whereas in every other money, if the thing gets chosen as a money, there's a negative feedback loop that brings the supply up and therefore brings the price down and makes it less effective as a store of value. With Bitcoin, we have this positive feedback loop, which I call the all-conquering juggernaut positive feedback loop of economic incentives. If people demand Bitcoin as a store of value, the price of Bitcoin rises or the value of Bitcoin rises. That makes mining Bitcoin more profitable. So more people want to mine Bitcoin, but more processing power will go into mining it. The supply cannot increase, right? If mining is more profitable for anything, mining gold is more profitable, we get more gold. If mining copper becomes more profitable, we get more copper. But if mining Bitcoin becomes more profitable, we still get the same quantity of Bitcoin, but instead we get more processing power going into mining Bitcoin. And the more processing power goes into Bitcoin, the more secure the network becomes, the more expensive the network is to attack. That's why proof of work is not a waste. That's why, you know, all of the electricity that Bitcoin spends and all the processing power going towards it is not a waste. It's an essential, it's, it's essential for the operation of the system. And Bitcoin would be completely unworkable without it. So as the uh, demand for Bitcoin increases, the price rises, the mining becomes more profitable. More processing power goes towards mining Bitcoin. That makes the network more secure, more expensive to attack. And then that means that the network continues to resist attack, continues to resist hacking. And that is in no small part um, explains why in almost 10 years of operation, Bitcoin itself has not been hacked once. So people's coins have been stolen, exchanges have been hacked, but Bitcoin itself has never been hacked successfully. In other words, you've never seen one single invalid transaction confirmed on the Bitcoin network. And this is quite astonishing. And I think it occurred to me, you know, one other of the many reasons why Bitcoin is different from all the other coins is that you'll never see a Bitcoin engineer go about boasting about this. Uh, whereas, you know, coins that, have, that are still haven't launched, you know, th th that are just essentially vaporware for fundraising, go around making all sorts of outlandish claims about their security. And yet Bitcoin engineers, you know, they're extremely humble and extremely, um, ex extremely careful about the claims that they make. And yet, you know, think about it. Bitcoin's been operating for almost 10 years and it's confirmed hundreds of millions of transactions over those 10 years. And yet not one of these transactions that has received one single confirmation not one transaction received the confirmation without it being valid. You know, every time somebody has spent, has spent Bitcoin and received the confirmation, 
they had that balance. They weren't double spending it. They didn't spend coins that didn't exist or they manipulated the system in order to enrich themselves. That has not worked once. And that is, you know, there are a lot of reasons for it. But one of those reasons is because of all of the increase in the processing power making the network expensive to attack. So the longer the network goes on not being attacked, the longer the network goes on illustrating that it doesn't get hacked, the more people trust in it to use it as a store of value and as a medium of exchange. And that in turn leads to more demand for it as a store of value. You know, in other words, you know, the best marketing for Bitcoin and the only thing that Bitcoin needs to continue to succeed is to just continue to operate like it has been without getting attacked because you know that started off it wasn't getting attacked when a bitcoin was worth a cent it wasn't getting attacked when bitcoin was worth a dollar and now when bitcoin is six thousand dollars it's still also not getting attacked and so that just continues to show the track record to people who are interested and you know prove to them that it is um, it's useful as a store of value so this Positive feedback loop is why Bitcoin continues to grow, in my opinion, because it's, you know, with any other monetary asset, you'd have that negative feedback loop where an increase in demand brings an increase in the supply, brings a drop in the price and makes the thing less attractive as a form of money. But with Bitcoin, it's just positive feedback loops all over. So more demand, more security, more demand, more security, and so on. And this is why, you know, in almost 10 years, Bitcoin has gone from one over a thousand of a dollar per Bitcoin and now to more than $6,000 per Bitcoin. I mean, it's an astonishing increase in the value of Bitcoin, and it is largely due to, or at least this is how I like to understand it, it's because of this positive feedback loop, and this is how Bitcoin is different from any other kind of money before. So how secure is Bitcoin? You know, if you want to think about how much processing power goes into Bitcoin, and we're talking about about 500,000 transactions per day, you know, uh, that's... um, complicated number how we arrive at it not exactly accurate to say that these are transactions but you know roughly 500,000 transactions as a generous estimate of um, on-chain transactions per day the processing power behind that is about 4 million times the world's top supercomputer about 4 trillion times your laptop and so these the same number of transactions can be done on your laptop you know your laptop can do much more than half a million transactions per day You can do maybe half a million transactions per hour or maybe even per minute on your laptop. It's not very difficult. But the problem with doing it on your laptop is that, you know, it requires us to trust you and your laptop. And it's not very difficult to attack your laptop. Um, And uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from our speakers today about all the many wonderful ways in which your laptop can be compromised. um, But Bitcoin is very hard to compromise. If you're going to try and use your laptop against Bitcoin, the key thing to understand is that Bitcoin is processing, is security through brute force, through just spending money on proof of work. So if you, you, can, you can attack Bitcoin, you can change the ledger of transactions, but you have to spend billions of dollars at this point accumulating processing power to it. To the point where, you know, even I think, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a theoretical cost for attacking Bitcoin today. And, you know, you could say, well, yeah, the price of hash power is this much, so we need that much hash power. So then if we have, say, 5 billion, we could maybe do it. But I don't think that's even accurate because, you know, you can't just wish a wish for hash power and have it materialize. Santa Claus doesn't exist. You have to actually produce the hash power. And if you start getting into producing it, as you're producing it, you know, you're, you're playing catch up to others who are also producing hash power to secure the network and that essentially makes it makes the cost continue to go up so it might not even be possible even with five billion dollars to try and attack bitcoin it might not even be possible to attack it so that means that you know as bitcoin exists it has no single point of failure it has no single piece of critical hardware or or infrastructure no single critical individual or organization you know you could uh, you know there's no single person who's indispensable for bitcoin's operation no server anywhere, no building anywhere, nobody is indispensable for Bitcoin. And effectively, it can't be stopped. It's a protocol. It's essentially a program that anybody can run on their computer. And every 10 minutes, these computers all over the world get together and decide on a new block of transactions. And the only thing that you can do is, uh, 
either join that or not join it. It's, I wouldn't say impossible, but I mean, it's far, far, far more unlikely than likely that you are able to stop it. And we'll see, you know, as time goes on, that just gets more and more costly. And that's why, you know, in about 10 years, it's never confirmed one fraudulent transaction. So why is Bitcoin unique? Because it's the hardest money that has ever been invented, the hardest money to ever produced. And it's available for everyone with an internet connection worldwide. It's purely voluntary. It does not re need regulation, enforcement, or police for it to work. And it has worked perfectly fine without any of these people trying to help it. And it is chosen and valued freely on the market. And that's what the definition of sound money is. So if you, um, you, know, if you, if you read the Austrian economist, which I reference extensively in the book, their definition of what makes good money or sound money is money whose value is determined on the market. The people who, who transact with it are transacting with it consensually with one another and they agree to the value. So you agree that you know, five Bitcoins will buy you a car, that's it. You know, nobody is forcing you to accept that Bitcoin. And it's, it's, it's maybe the most astonishing thing about Bitcoin, that you know, the value of Bitcoin has emerged purely on the market. And this was really the most critical point of Bitcoin when somebody paid actual uh, dollars or other currencies for it, its value emerged on its own. And it's a complete refutation of uh, the statist view of money as money as being just a creation of government. Because no government anywhere told anybody that you have to accept Bitcoin at this value. No government anywhere told anyone that, you know, you have to accept Bitcoin, as is the case with other uh, with government money. And yet Bitcoin grew and accepted uh, and uh, grew in acceptance and grew in value freely on the market without anybody having to uh, force anyone to do it. And that's why, in my opinion, it constitutes sound money. So what is Bitcoin then good for? For me, the most obvious application and use of Bitcoin is as a store of value. Because it is the first strictly scarce liquid asset. And I think um, this, is, this is something that I haven't seen mentioned anywhere. Um, one of my favorite economists is the late Julian Simon, who passed away about 20 years ago, I think. And he wrote a wonderful book called The Ultimate Resource. And he talks about how, you know, uh, he's, he was pretty famous in the 70s and 80s for being the... Uh, the spoil sort for all of the environmental hysteria that uh, had been going on back then. So those of you who were around in the 70s may remember how we were going to run out of oil, we were going to run out of nickel, we we're going to run out of zinc, we we're going to run out of pretty much anything because, you know, industrial society is just sucking the earth dry and we're all going to die because one day we're going to wake up and there's not going to be any more oil or water or zinc or whatever left. And so Simon, you know, he had a bet with an environmentalist about this and he wrote extensively about it. And he was, for anybody with a brain, I think, you know, he was proven irrefutably correct in the fact that we don't have any scarcity of any of those things. These things are not strictly scarce. The only thing that is truly scarce is human time. Because with human time, we can make more of any of those things. So, you know, in the 1970s, environmentalists were saying, well, look at how much nickel we're producing, and look at how much nickel we know we have on Earth, and look at how much we're consuming. In six years, we're going to run out of nickel. In 12 years, extrapolate the numbers, we're going to run out of zinc. And here we are, 50 years later, and we produce and consume more zinc than we ever produced and consumed before. So how can you explain that? Well, the simple answer is that the more people demand zinc, the more other people will find ways of digging for it and, and finding it. And so the production of every single metal has increased as demand for it has increased. And the only scarcity of any of these metals or any of these things is relative scarcity. The only limit on how much nickel or copper or gold we have is how much time we dedicate to it, which is limited by how much time we dedicate to other things. So, you know, we could triple gold production next year if we try hard enough, but it would require us to, you know, give up on other things. So, of course, we don't do it because the other things are too important for us. And so, nothing is truly strictly scarce anywhere because the supply can always be increased. And that brings us back to the easy money trap that if anything gets used as money, its supply will be increased. So, Bitcoin is the only thing that we've invented that's also strictly scarce, just like time, just like human time on Earth. Because no matter what we do, we'll never have more than 21 million Bitcoins. 
And no matter what we do, we won't have more than our time on Earth. You know, your time on Earth is limited and you know. You can eat a lot of steak and be healthy and extend your time, but at the end of the day, it's, it's scarce. You know, you're going to run out of time on this earth. We're all goners uh, on a long enough timeline. So the, 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 the interesting thing here is that, you know, think, you can think of the function of the store of value as being the, you know, the store of value is what you do in order to store the value that you produce, what you use in order to store the value that you produce with your time. So you work today, you make $100, and you'd like to store those $100 for you to spend next year, or you want to save them with other hundreds of dollars for next year. You can think of the scarcity of the medium of exchange or the store of value that you're using as being its efficiency. The easier it is for others to produce it, the less useful it is as a store of value. So think of the Venezuelans. They're putting their money in bolivars, but the value of the bolivar collapses very quickly. So the ability of others to increase the supply of your store of value is, you can think of it as the bug in the store of value. It's the failure. It's the inefficiency of it. And Bitcoin completely fixes that. It's, the, it's, it's like the engine that has no inefficiency because nobody can make more Bitcoin. Nobody can increase the supply. So if you store your value in a Bitcoin today, then you're just storing it in one out of 21 million Bitcoins that will ever exist 100 years from now it'll still be one out of 21 million bitcoins. Whereas if you store it in gold, in copper, in dollars, in Venezuelan bolivars, in anything else, you're storing it in one section of the demand, uh, in one section or one small slice of the supply, but the supply itself is increasing. So Bitcoin must uh, be, in my opinion, the best and most advanced technology for transferring value of time into the future. It's the best technology for transferring value into the future because its value, uh, its supply cannot be increased. It's strictly scarce just like your time on earth. And that's why I think it's, it's, it's enormously interesting. And that's why, you know, people who have used it as a store of value for anything beyond, say, uh, two years, anybody who's held Bitcoin for two years has more or less done well. Well, maybe two and a half, three years. But, you know, it has increased in value at any of these uh, durations. And secondly, I think the second important application of what Bitcoin is good for is that it's a decentralized free market alternative to central banks and gold. That's, the, that's where the title for my book comes from. It's the Bitcoin standard. Bitcoin is effectively similar to gold in that regard, but it is a more advanced digital form of gold. And I think, you know, as I was writing this book, you know, I... I I didn't emphasize this enough in the book that it's it's not a prediction about how things are going to unfold. It's already a reality that is that we're seeing unfold online. It is already operational in the sense that if you look at the kind of transactions that take place on Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain, you know we have 100, 200, 300, 400 thousand transactions per day, roughly. The maximum we've had is about 500 thousand, but these are. The, these transactions, you know, once we hit the number of about three, four, five hundred thousand, people started saying, well, Bitcoin has reached its capacity. Bitcoin can't scale. It'll never increase beyond that capacity. And yet what has happened is that, you know, the, the transaction fees went up. And as a result of that, people who use Bitcoin, particularly companies that use Bitcoin, exchanges, uh, online casinos, any kind of website that uses Bitcoin, uh, with, that allows its users to use Bitcoin, they started paying a higher transaction fee. And so how did they fix that? How did they go around that? They started prioritizing. Uh, they, they started um, settling their transactions on the blockchain and then having all of their um, you know, individual transactions ca- um, accounted for on their own second layer solution. In other words, if Coinbase, a few years ago, any transaction that happened on their platform was being uh, recorded on the Bitcoin blockchain. As the transaction fees rose, they learned that this was, you know, this was a stupid way for them to uh, waste their VCs' money. Although not as stupid as many of the other ways they're wasting their VCs' money, like crypto kitties or all of that. But <laughs> still, not a bad, stupid way. Um, and so, you know, the, what they did was that they started figuring out, well, you know, if two people on Coinbase want to send money to one another, we don't have to broadcast it to the whole network. We can just record it on our ledger. And then when one of them wants to take their money out, or when we want to settle accounts with another exchange, we settle, we, 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 you know, we settle 
for many, many transactions with one transaction on the blockchain. So at this point, it's really hard, obviously, to come up with an estimate of how much transactions are on-chain versus how much are off-chain. But I would say it's at least double. There's at least double the transactions taking place in Bitcoin than there are uh, double the transactions are taking place off-chain than there are than on-chain. And so as we see, you know, it's possible to increase Bitcoin on-chain transactions, but only marginally you know we could go maybe from half a million per day to one million maybe two million maybe five million it's completely out of the question that we go to say 10 billion transactions on chain in 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 bitcoin Uh, but off-chain transactions can increase exponentially right so coinbase now are doing double the transactions that you do on chain they're doing them off chain but there's no limit to how much they could increase that they could go by 10x tomorrow and then another 10x the day after and then another 10x the day after you know, there's no limit on how much um, Coinbase's second layer transactions can scale. And so what we're seeing is essentially identical to the gold standard. If you think about how the gold standard developed, how gold became money, um, you know, people think that, you know, when gold was money, everybody walked around with gold coins clinking in their pockets. And that's not true. The, the way it worked is that the gold sat in a bank and then people exchanged papers, receipts, for that gold, or they exchanged checks, or they exchanged all kinds of other financial instruments. And for every movement of a piece of paper backed by gold, for every hundred movements or thousand movements, you had one movement of the physical gold itself settling between two banks at the end of the day, or you'd go and withdraw your physical gold, or you'd move, you know, my bank would settle with yours at the end of the day or the week or the month. You know, hundreds or thousands of payments would happen off chain, if you want, with payment instruments, for every one single payment that had a physical movement of gold. Because obviously moving gold around is expensive, it's insecure, and it's not very easy. The way that the gold standard scaled was through this increase in the supply, not through, uh, sorry, through increase of what you could think of as second layer transactions. And that's essentially what we're seeing with Bitcoin, uh, how, how we're seeing Bitcoin develop. So if we have that monetary standard all over the world, what does it mean? What are the implications of it? I think the first thing to think of is that, you know, this is going to encourage low time preference. This is why I'm here. This is why I was interested in Bitcoin in the first place. I was always very, very interested in understanding the cultural and economic and personal effects of having hard money versus easy money. And in particular, the impact on time preference. And time preference refers to the degree to which a person discounts the future compared to the present. So obviously, everybody prefers the present. In other words, if I told you, would you rather have, you say, this iPhone today or one year from now? Everybody would choose to take it today. The only reason you would wait uh, to buy it in a year is if the price drops. And so everybody always prefers consumption in the present. But if you have the ability to store value into the future, you become more and more likely to store value into the future. Whereas if you don't have it, then you're less likely to do it. So in other words, easy money money that loses its value a lot encourages people to spend more and more today and to focus on today because what's the point of saving your $100 for next year if next year they're going to be worth $50? On the other hand, if your $100 today will rise to $105 next year, you're far more likely to save it or save at least a part of it. And so I think this is a far uh, more uh, significant factor than most people consider. Easy money, which is another way, of, another way of thinking of it, is that easy money means artificially low interest rates, right? If the money supply is increasing, that means that the interest rates are uh, dropping. And so if interest rates are low, your incentive is to borrow, not to save, right? When your bank is offering you 1% on your deposits, you're less likely to save and you're more likely to borrow. And so the impact of having easy money is that it makes people want to borrow more and it makes people want to save less. And that has enormous consequences. So uh, let me just skip to this one. So if you look at how Western economies have done over the last uh, 50 years or so, we see a constant decline in the savings rate. And the only exception to that is Switzerland, which is at the top, which was the last country to get off the gold standard, and the one country whose money is arguably the hardest of all the uh, other currencies. Everywhere else, as the value of the money goes down, the incentive to save goes down, and we see practically... You know, saving is unheard of for people in our generation. Most people in my generation, you know, you get your first paycheck, you spend it all. And then when you have a major expense, you borrow. And then you spend the rest of your life 
uh, paying that off. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, this was not the case. You know, you kept on saving from day to day because the value of your money goes up and people died and passed on their savings onto their children and capital accumulated from one generation to the other, which is different from what we have today. So then the question becomes, does this mean that we're going to be um, not spending? Does this mean that, you know, the economy is going to collapse because everybody's waiting on their money to appreciate and then we all starve? Obviously not, contrary to Keynesian propaganda. Just because the value of the money goes up doesn't mean you're going to starve yourself and die for the future because if you starve and die, you're not going to be able to be there to consume. And my favorite example for explaining this is, look at this 10 megabyte hard disk for $3,500 in 1980. In 1980, you could have bought this for this much money. In 2010, you could have bought a 10 megabyte hard disk on a little tiny USB key for maybe a dollar or less in 2010. So why, why would you buy it in 1980? What kind of idiot would spend $3,500 when they could just wait 30 years and then buy it for a few cents, right? Well, the kind of idiots, obviously they're not idiots, they're very smart people who were buying that hard drive in 1980 are probably people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. By buying that hard drive back then, you know, they were able to invest in building companies that then worked out for them much better than saving the 3500 bucks in the long run. I'm sure you would agree. So the point is that if the money gains value, yes, the Keynesians are correct in identifying the trend of a reduction in spending and an increase in saving. But they're completely delusional if they think that the economy will collapse because people are not spending at all. Because people have to spend, people have to consume. So hard money is not going to eliminate your time preference. It's not going to make you want to not consume anything. You still need to eat. You still need to live in a house. You still need to wear clothes. You still need to protect yourself from the winter and the cold. But you're going to be far le more, far less reckless in how you spend, far less frivolous. You're going to be spending money on less stupid uh, nonsense that you don't need and you're going to be focusing your spending on things that you actually need and so what that means is that people save more people save more people invest more people accumulate more capital and that really is you know according to economist Hans Hermann Hoppe he calls time preference or low time preference he says that is what initiates the process of civilization this is really how human civilization happens in fact, this is how we separate from other animals, how we separate from other kinds of monkeys who can only think about the present. You know, a monkey gets hungry and it tries to find food and then it eats until it's not hungry anymore and is just continuously responding to its inner urges without having to, any ability to, of uh, thinking about the long run. But human beings don't think like that. Human beings, you know, you're hungry right now, you, okay, you hunt, but then you can spend some time not on eating for today, you can spend time on accumulating, on building tools, in other words, building capital for you to be able to eat tomorrow. So if you are able to spend time working today, not to be rewarded today, but in order for you to be able to eat better tomorrow, that's what capital accumulation is. That's the delayed gratification. That's saving, essentially. And the more people are able to do that, the more capital they accumulate. That's really the process of civilization. And you can think of civilization, you know, as an intergenerational process of people accumulating more and more capital, getting, becoming more and more productive, being able to produce more and more, and continuously getting better uh, material living standards. That's really how you can, that's really how I understand civilization. It's something that's enhanced with hard money, but there's something that is reversed with easy money. And that's why, you know, you can, the, the, the graph of the dropping rate of saving is, you know, it's pretty worrying because people are not accumulating capital anymore. But it's not just an economic factor. It reflects, I believe, time preference is a reflection of all kinds of economic aspects, uh, all kinds of personal decisions. And I think, you know, your economic time frame for making decisions will be reflected on everything. So if people are able to accumulate more capital, they can stop focusing their life on the drudgery of daily survival. You know, survival is no longer a problem for you. You have a home, you have food, you have reliable sources for all of that stuff. Then you can start thinking about things that are more elevated, things like art, technology, culture, and so on. And I think time preference is a great reflection of this. And this is really my <laughs> best way of illustrating this. This is how, on the right, we see the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo. That's 
That's how your art looks on hard money. Michelangelo, you know, back then it was hard money. And there's a poem that I quote by Michelangelo in my, uh, in my book where he talks about how he painted the Sistine Chapel. And, you know, present that poem to any artists you know today and see if any of them would be willing to do that. You know, four years hanging from a rope on the roof of the church, smelling rancid air, using paint. And he developed all sorts of illnesses and problems from doing all of that. Yes, that Michelangelo, you know, it wasn't easy. It wasn't a walk in the park for him to make those things. He didn't just waltz into the church and scroll a few things and then walk out and demand millions of dollars for it. He worked hard for it. And that's how art was. It took him many, many, many years to develop the skills to be able to draw this. And it took him four years to be able to draw it. You compare that to the kind of artists we have today. On the right, we have a piece of art by a guy called Mark Rothko. And it essentially involves the skills that, you know, any 10-year-old could learn in 15 minutes and execute in another five minutes. Really, I mean, just you need one bucket of yellow paint and one bucket of red paint and a 10-year-old and tell him, here, draw this, draw that, and there you go. You could reproduce the same exact painting in less than an hour by a 15-year-old with absolutely no skill. And, you know, for people who say art is, well, you know, art is subjective, and obviously most artists, they get extremely offended when I say this. It's obviously because I don't understand Rothko, and I don't understand the genius that went into scribbling that stuff over there. Well, no, it's not subjective, and you can't bully me into having to accept that this is equal to that, because that took years of hard work and skill and dedication. This one takes 15 minutes, and that's really, I think, an enormously important difference, and it's a difference that you can't really see outside of easy and hard money. And, and uh, you know, I'm not just saying all of that stuff myself. I'm, I'm definitely not an art expert, but I know somebody who is. A guy called Jack Barzun, you may have heard of him. He's an art critic who died a few years ago. And he's, he died, he was about 100 years old. So he lived throughout the 20th century, all of it. He lived the entirety of the 20th century. And he, he's got a book called From Dawn to Decadence, which is an amazing book about the rise and fall of Western civilization. And he times the beginning of the fall of Western civilization as the, move, uh, as the year 1914 specifically, which not coincidentally is the, period, is the same year at which almost all the Western economies moved towards uh, fiat money. It's when governments went off the gold standard and moved towards government money. It's, I, I don't think it's a coincidence because we move towards that world and then everybody's time preference rises and then nobody has time to start drawing all of these you know, complicated churches. And it's really astonishing when you think about it. I mean, Churches are being built everywhere around the world today, and you never find a church that produces anything like the Sistine Chapel. It's really astonishing. All of the artists that we have, all the millions that people like Damien Hirst and Mark Rothko and all these modern artists produce, none of them can make anything that will actually survive beyond 100 years. You know, I mean, it's going to take so much effort to try and keep that uh, uh, painting alive, but really... You know, not, none of it survives. None of it is worthwhile. None of it takes any uh, amount of time to produce. Another aspect which I discuss in the book is innovation. We like to think of technology as always advancing, and of course it is. But there's a very strong case, and I provide some evidence for it in the book, that the 19th century really was the pinnacle of human innovation. In fact, if you look at the num the, there's a study that was done of the 6,000 most important innovations in human history, a huge book. And then another guy took that book and then... Um, took all the innovations and timed them, and then compared them to um, human population to get a rate of innovation per capita per year. And you see that it peaks around the end of the 19th century and then begins to drop in the 20th century. It might just be that the 19th century was the pinnacle of human civilization, and then by ruining our monetary standard, which is an enormously important technology, you know, money for us is hugely important, by replacing the hard money that was gold with the easy money that is government money that governments can print, we've ruined our time preference and we've ruined our ability to think of the future. And in terms of technological innovation, you know, if you think about all of the things that we identify as being technologies of the 20th century, they were all pretty much invented in the 19th, but improved upon and you know, popularized and made cheaper in the 20th, which is, I think, quite shocking if you think about it that way. So... Um, in conclusion, you know, civilization is built by people with low time preference. It's destroyed by people with high time preference who think of the long term or who think only of the short term. 
And so this is really the first one. The second implication of Bitcoin or a Bitcoin standard is limited government. If you think about it, you know, capital is becoming more and more informational and less uh, the importance of physical capital is growing less and less. So more and more of our economic activity is just being carried out by people uh, that is just intellectual. You know, people write or people produce graphic design or people who produce websites or accounting services. A lot of it is just not physical anymore. It's all about information. And that stuff is much easier to move around. It's much, you know, when the capital is in your mind, it's easy for you to move it around. Whereas if the capital is physical, it's much harder to move it around. So the one way in which government have managed to control, uh, or the way in which governments have managed to control capital production is because it was physical. And in the era of industrialization over the last three, four hundred years, that has just allowed governments to, you know, uh, because industrialization is fixed physical capital, it allowed governments to be able to control economic activity much more. But now people are able to exit with their economic capital and with Bitcoin, it makes the financial system that they can use also available, uh, also uh, outside the reach of government. And so that makes it much harder for governments to continue to confiscate wealth and force people to work for them. And so I think the model we're going to have is that governments are going to move from taxing um, and, and you know, trying to milk the people under their population as much as possible. They're going to move towards trying to compete for people as much as possible. And I think that's going to be a very good thing. Um, I think that you know, without the ability of governments to tax uh, as much as they want, you know, the nanny state and the managerial state, I think, are not with us for long. The 21st century is going to see us go back to 19th century conceptions of limited government. Um, and, you know, government is going to become much more restricted in its ability to tax that it's almost going to become, taxes are almost going to become voluntary or close to voluntary. In other words, you know, this horrific dystopia is going to look like a place like Switzerland. You know, Switzerland is a country where nobody knows who the president is. Anybody here know the president of Switzerland? Nope. Not even the Swiss people know who the president is. The president of Switzerland doesn't matter. Why? Because he doesn't do anything. He cuts a few ribbons every couple of months and, you know, opens a, a kindergarten here or there or whatever. But he has no ability of destroying your life. He has no ability of controlling your life. Compare that to the president of Venezuela or North Korea, who everybody in the world knows, and everybody in North Korea and Venezuela knows because they control everything in your life. And so the less important government role is, I think, the better society functions. And that's what we're going to be seeing more and more, that it's go society is going to look a lot more like Switzerland and less like uh, North Korea. And then finally, the economic aspect of this, and this is something that uh, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I don't have much time to talk about, and explain, but you know, if you want to, uh, if you want to learn more about it, you should uh, read my book about it. Essentially, all of the problems of the world, if you uh, look at economics from my sort of Austrian uh, perspective, all of the economic problems in the world come from easy money. Well, not all, but you know, the majority of them. So, inflation and recessions and business cycles essentially are just a product of easy money. It's a product of inflationary money. If you look at Switzerland which was on the gold standard up until the mid-1970s, unemployment there did not exist. Inflation also did not exist. The value of the Swiss franc continued to go up as, uh, as it was pegged to gold, and the value of gold continues to rise slightly every year. And so the value of the money goes up, and yet there's zero unemployment. Of course, nobody likes to talk about this because it's exactly the opposite of what the Keynesian perspective says. The Keynesian perspective says if we don't devalue the currency, People won't spend, and then nobody would work, and we'd have high unemployment. It's the exact opposite. If the currency is stable, if the currency is strong, if the currency appreciates in value, the economic calculation problem is solved. People are able to plan economically wisely. And you can think about hard money as just being the correct way of making economic calculations. Easy money, whose value and supply are constantly changing, are just always making people make economic mistakes. And so you see, as Switzerland went off the gold standard in the mid-1970s, they started getting their uh, you know, Keynesian funny money. They start getting unemployment. And then in the 1990s, thanks to U.S. Uh, foreign policy and the IMF, they told the Swiss to, sold half of, uh, to sell half of their gold. And I think the idea was, you know, something about aiding Africa or something or the other. And look, you can see it. I mean, in the early 90s, the unemployment had still been around 1% and then boom, it goes up to 
And now it's, you know, it's just like any other economy where the unemployment is just a normal part of economic life. And, and, and you know, for Keynesian economists, you know, unemployment is just always going to be there. And that's why they never like to talk about the period in the Swiss economy where they didn't have unemployment. And so now you see it's just continuously increasing. And those of you who follow technical analysis could probably ch- make this chart and see how likely Switzerland is going to have 100% unemployment soon if this breaks out any further. But um, f- uh, finally, you know, having an international monetary standard where we don't have a foreign exchange market, I think, is an enormously important thing because really the foreign exchange market is possibly one of the stupidest inventions that we as human beings have ever done because it's completely useless. It's, it's essentially uninventing money. We, we, money used to be one thing that we used all over the world <laughs> as gold in the 19th century. And so if you wanted to buy something from... If you're in Dallas and you wanted to buy something from Mexico or Canada, you just bought with the same money, just like you bought from Dallas. Now, we've gone back to a system of barter where before you buy something from Mexico just across the border, you have to buy their money first and then buy something from them, which is an enormously idiotic thing to do. I mean, it's, 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 it's technological regression. You know, we had one money and that made life so much better for everyone and then we decided to uninvent it so that our governments can have the ability to print more and more money and so all of these things i think can be reversed by a global monetary standard like bitcoin which is going to give us a free market and money in savings and capital and investments and effectively really roll back all of the damage that easy money has done this is my book and i'll have some copies to sell and uh, sign outside And if you'd like to get in touch with me, this is my contact information. Thank you very much for this. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, Tony. It was great to hear that. You know, I think we were so busy during the event, I really didn't get to uh, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. We were running around making sure everything was working correctly. And uh, it was our first conference together. And we did a good job. We learned a lot for the next time. Learned a lot. Yeah, there were there were some behind the scenes mistakes, but listening to Safe, I thought his talk was it really just scratches the surface because you get a sense for the importance of money and how it affects civilization. And in the book, you can really read it. You know, you can read it slowly. I enjoy reading his book because I bought the Kindle edition and just took it out on my Kindle and closed my alerts and all of that and just read it quietly. And that quiet read you get a real sense for what he's saying. And it's very, it's very powerful and it's very important that money can transform a civilization. And we've been living in a very dark time in the 20th century. So I highly recommend reading his book. You will get a lot out of it. It hadn't been that dark for me, to be honest with you. I've been pretty damn happy, to be honest. Well, you weren't one of the 250 million people killed. So. No, I wasn't. So as I say, it wasn't that dark for me. <laughs> You know, I I only change the things I have the ability to change. But a big thank you to Safe for coming to BitBlock Boom. As you see, Tony and I, we we aren't in total line. If nothing else, you should know that by now on everything. But we do get along real well. But we're not in total line with everything. We see the world slightly differently. Yes. Well, I would say more than slightly. Um, (laughs) But a big thanks to Safe for coming coming to BitBlock Boom. And also, uh, Tony... We didn't mention that we had interviewed Safe on episode 44, I believe, of the Crypto Cousins uh, podcast. That's right. And that was a long – we had to cut that one off. It was over an hour. Mm-hmm. And we were like, oh, gosh, we got to cut that off. We could have gone another hour. We need to get him back on. We need to, We got a lot of people we need to get on. I, I contacted Nick Baca uh, about being on Nick next Baca, week. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Nick is just burning it up on Twitter, and he is really uh, – we, I think we, I feel really good about Nick uh, that we were the first to kind of give him a platform to present his ideas, and now he's become a real thought leader in the space. Yeah, he said in his email last night how much he appreciated us letting him speak at uh, Bitblock Boom, and uh, how how excited he was to have been a part of that. And we also need to get Tour on here uh, mm-hmm. and do an interview with Tour. But um, oh well, this show's been long. I should start uh, just a chit chat up now, right? Exactly. So I guess I'm going to say a big thank you for everybody who's listening, subscribing, and leaving comments on iTunes or YouTube, wherever. Give us a review and a comment. If you want to subscribe to this show and you're not, just go to CryptoCousins.com slash subscribe. Tony, anything you want to add before we get out of here? Thanks for listening this long, if you're still with us. And uh, we really do appreciate your 
listening, and uh, we, we do our best to um, give you the latest and greatest uh, in the Bitcoin space. And don't forget, you can call us with questions or comments at 747-777-9471 or email us at thecryptocousins at gmail.com. And on Twitter, we're at crypto underscore cousins. That's correct. Yes, on yeah. Twitter. Crypto Wish underscore. whoever had that crypto cousins would give it to us. They don't use it. So if anyone knows who has that crypto cousins, tell them to give it to us. They aren't using it. The cousins. They're so funny. Yeah. <laughs> Distant cousins. Distant cousins. <laughs> that, that, yeah, they're second removed. Uh, uh, maybe they passed away. Who knows? Maybe they're one of those people you're talking about, Tony. Maybe. Uh, oh. Mm. <laughs> Bad karma going there. Okay. We're out of here, Tony. Talk to you later. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Love you. Thanks for listening to the Crypto Cousins Podcast. Please share this podcast with anyone you know that is interested in cryptocurrency. Your friends can subscribe on iTunes at CryptoCousins.com slash iTunes and on Android at CryptoCousins.com slash play. If you want to know more about Tony or Gary, just go to TonySicala.com or GaryLeland.com. Make sure and join us on the next episode, and thanks for listening. The Crypto Cousins podcast and information in the podcast are not intended as investment advice. Cryptocurrencies are risky. Never invest more than you can afford to lose. Always seek professional advice before making any investment. Investing in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies may present tremendous risks. Please understand that you are using any and all information available on or through the Crypto Cousins podcast at your own risk. Yeah.